Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll while the tempest still is high hide me oh my savior hide till the storm of life is past safe into the haven guide oh receive my soul at last other refuge have i none hangs my helpless soul on thee live or leave me not alone still support and comfort me all my trust on thee is stayed all my help from thee I bring cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing I never sing this third verse most gospel songs, the third verse is the most neglected verse in the whole book. And many times, the third verse is one of the best. And I believe in this song it is. Thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. Raise the fallen Cheer the faint, heal the sick, and lead the blind. Just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness, vile and full of sin I am. Thou art full of truth and grace, plenteous grace with thee is found, grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Thou of life, the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart rise to all eternity amen thank you honey bun i appreciate that so very much i love that old song anybody know who wrote that song charles wesley that's how old that song is uh, he was a great uh, preacher great hymn writer and uh, he, um, he wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I believe it was him that wrote that. And I believe I read somewhere that that was his personal testimony of, of Christ's salvation in his life. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Great old songs. Boy, I hope we never, hope we never get away from those old songs. They got so much doctrine in them, so much truth in them. Not saying the songs of today don't, 
but not as many of them do. Many of them seem to have more emphasis on the melody to try to stir your emotion, but it's the lyric that gets the job done and is the message. Revelation chapter 21 tonight. <coughs> now that's not good to swallow the wrong way right before you start preaching. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, may we? Our Father, in Jesus' name, we have been on this journey for many, many weeks, Lord, going through your apocalypse, your revelation. Thank you, Lord, for what we have seen and learned. Thank you, Lord, for giving us understanding. Though this was not a deep study, it wasn't meant to be. It was more of an overview of the revelation. Uh, a, a deep teaching of it would take far longer than what we have given to it these weeks. But Lord, we thank you for what we have seen. And as I said last week, we pray that we have gained some understanding. And we pray that, Lord, we have gained a sense of urgency. We know that you're coming back really soon. We don't know when, but we know it's soon. We know that you're closer now than you were yesterday. And our Heavenly Father, that's an assurance that we can count on. And Lord, we know that one day, what we're going to talk about tonight is going to be our residence for eternity. So we pray, our Father, that you'd help us to be clear in our teaching and our explanations tonight of the Scriptures. And may they bring joy to the heart of the listener and a burden for lost sinners in the heart of the believers. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now that all the judgments are over, we, have, we are now the Lamb's wife. We have gone through the marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb. The battle of Armageddon has been fought. The devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and all of the condemned of mankind are in the lake of fire. It's time to take a breath for just a moment and uh, focus our attention on the next glorious thing that the Lord wants us to see in this great apocalypse. Well, what could be left, <laughs> preacher? All the judgment is over. All of sin has been dealt with and uh, eradicated, what is there left to look at? Well, there's really two things. Chapter 21, we're going to look at the new things that God is going to bring to those who have put their faith and trust in Him, who have loved Him, given their self to Him. And then, Lord willing, next week in the 22nd chapter, we will see the last things. The last things God wants us to see in his word. Don't ever forget that the word of God is not all that God knows, but it's all that God wants us to know. And so as we look tonight and at this um, 21st chapter, um, I titled this message tonight, God's Glorious New Things. If you notice in the fifth verse there of the 25th chapter, or it's the fifth verse of the 21st chapter, if you find the 25th chapter of Revelation, Go throw your Bible away. Hey Amen. The King James don't have but 22. I'm sorry. The, 20, the fifth verse of the 21st chapter, the Bible says, uh, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And uh, then the verse proceeds to verify that statement by further saying, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now, in the 21st chapter, and uh, the, actually on into the first seven verses of the 22nd chapter contain uh, basically seven new things that God is going to bring into existence uh, when all of this judgment is over. The first thing we are going to notice in verses 1 and 2 uh, that he's going to prepare a new heaven and a new earth. 
Now, why is he having to prepare a new heaven and a new earth? Well, he tells us there in the first verse why. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and uh, there was no more sea. Now, you know, we have been, um, we've been dealing with this word sea in Revelation a few times. And uh, the two times that we dealt with it, uh, we found that it's referring to the, the sea, is not the watery sea, but it is the, the sea of humanity. When we come to the 21st chapter, I, I, I don't find that to be true. I don't find that he's talking about the, the sea of humanity. I, I believe he's actually talking about that on this new earth, there will be no oceans. Now, I don't know that for 100% for sure, but uh, some of the studying I've done, the commentaries I've studied, and, and other things uh, would lead me to believe uh, that there's literally no ocean on this new earth. Now, the reason that the first heaven and the first earth were passed away is because God had to purge that place. You see, there was a time... Uh, if I asked you when the first sin was committed, uh, you probably, no doubt, would say the Garden of Eden, wouldn't you? Well, that's not where the first sin was committed. First sin was committed in heaven. The first sin was committed by Lucifer, son of the morning, the anointed cherub, the chief musician of heaven, committed the first sin, the sin of rebellion. And he rose against God and a third of the angels. We've talked about that before uh, when we looked in the book of Jude. And he rose up with a third of the angels and tried to overthrow God. And he wanted his turn at being God. And so God threw him out. And uh, it was a, quite a cataclysmic event. And he was cast down into the earth. And uh, the angels that rebelled against him were placed in chains until the day of their judgment. And we looked at that judgment earlier in the Revelation. So God is going to have to cleanse the heaven and the earth. And he's going to purge it and cleanse it with fire. Now you know this verse in the book of 2 Peter chapter number 3 and in verse number 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now it doesn't say that the heaven and the earth is going to cease to exist, but it's going to be purged by fire, and God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Now then, this event will take place immediately following uh, the end of the great white throne of judgment, which comes at the end of the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. We looked at all of that last week. Now in verse number two, the Bible tells us that John said that he saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving 
and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now we looked at that last week as well. That when, uh, that when all of the Christ rejectors were judged, the Lord said, I never knew you, and they were cast into the lake of fire. Now in addition to a new heaven and a new, her, a new, a new earth, uh, this new place that we're going to live forever will have some new inhabitants, and that's us. And we find ourselves right here uh, in verse number, let me go back up here, uh, What well, ain't that something? Oh, verse number seven. Verse number seven. He says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, that word overcometh right there, we need to understand what that word means. The word overcometh there doesn't mean hold on and hold out. We don't have to hold on and hold out. We're kept by the power of God. We were endued with the Spirit of God when we were saved, and the Bible says that He abides with us forever. He never leaves us. That means forever. He never leaves us. That word overcometh right there literally means those whose victory is in Christ. That's what that word literally means right there. Those whose victory is in Christ shall inherit all things, and I will be His God, and He shall be my Son. Do you have victory in Jesus tonight? Well, if you've been saved by the grace of God, uh, you uh, have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are part of this crowd that the Bible's talking about, these new inhabitants of this great city we're going to look at here in just a moment. Now, I want you to notice some things that will not be in this new city where we're going to live forever. We're always excited about what's going to be there, but we need to take a moment and look at the list that God gave us that tells us of what is not going to be there. Number one, there's going to be no more tears. Praise God for that. Now, I will have to be honest with you. Um, I've tried to get a handle on why there would ever be tears in heaven. Why would, why would we be crying in heaven? What on earth would we have to cry about? And if they were tears of joy, well then why is God going to wipe them away? Why is there weeping in heaven? Well, I, I can't really get a firm handle on that. But if I look at the timing of when this event takes place in relation to the great white throne of judgment, I'm not so sure that we're not going to be witness to that judgment. I'm not going to dogmatically say that we are. But to stand there and to watch um, others be cast into that lake of fire alive, when I think about that, that certainly would cause tears. And uh, in, the, in the placement of the Word of God, that seems to make a little bit of sense. Like I told you a, a week or so back, me and my dad, we used to have some great discussions about the Bible. And, and just about the time I'd have something figured out, he'd have another vein of thought about that thing. And uh, I was talking to him about that, and I said, do you think that's what that means? He said, well, I don't know. He said, remember, when we get over there, we're going to have the mind of Christ. We're not going to have this limited mind that we have now. We will have the mind of Christ. We will understand all things. We will know as we're known. And I said, well, what's your point? He said, well, if we are there at the great white throne as an observer, he said, we may not be looking at those people as our friends or our loved ones who rejected Christ. He said, we may be looking upon them as an enemy. Don't know for sure on that. So rather than just jump over it and not say anything, I'll just confess to you that I'm not exactly sure 
what those tears are that God's going to wipe away. But this I do know is that there shall be no more tears in heaven. There's also going to be no more death and no more sorrow and no more crying and no more pain. Can anybody say amen to that? All of those things. And he said the former things are passed away. And as I said a while ago in verse number 7, that is reserved for those whose victory is in Christ Jesus. Now when we come down to verse number 9, I want to take a little bit of time with this right here <coughs> about what John saw. Now the Bible says in verse number 9, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great, high mount, great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, <coughs> having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. When we come to see this vision, this deserves our close attention. Because what we're reading about here is our forever home. Did you know that? That's where we're going to spend eternity. Where we're going to spend forever. So if we're going to spend forever there, let's take a minute and look at where we're going. Amen? I mean, you know, when you, when you got your house, you, you looked around it. You didn't just go in there sight unseen, didn't know anything about it. You looked it over. Well, let's look and see what God has waiting for us. The Bible tells us that, uh, that it's a great city, this holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. I want you to notice, first of all, it's a, it's a glorious city. The Bible says, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, <coughs> clear as crystal. Had to do a little study on that because a jasper stone uh, can, can be many different variations of color. The most common color is red, a deep red, about the color of our hymn books uh, from the ones I've seen in pictures. It also can have a variation of a little bit of yellow or golden in it. Not gold, but a golden color. But then there are some jasper stones that are clear and they glimmer. And a couple of commentators that I read after uh, seem to think that, they, that, that that might be referring to a diamond. Well, whatever it is, whatever this clear as crystal jasper stone is, uh, it is going to uh, be so bright and so glorious uh, that it is going to be um, one of the lights that lights that city. Then the Bible says that it's not only a glorious city and a well-lit city, but it's a walled city. It's got a wall, great and high. We're going to look at that a little bit later here in verse 17. And the Bible says that this city has got 12 gates. And there's three gates 
on each side. You got a north side, a south side, an east side, and a west side. So that means that this city is square. Would you agree with that? It's not a circle. It's not an elliptical. It's a, it's a square. It's got a north, south, east, and west side. And on each of these sides, uh, there are three gates. And each of these gates is uh, named, and the Bible says here that the gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's a 12 gates, there's 12 tribes of Israel, each gate named for one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the wall of the city, the wall that is around the city. Now we don't we don't have very many walled cities in the world anymore, I don't think. But back in Bible days, just about every city was walled. Not necessarily to keep the residents in, but to keep the enemies out. So that the enemies would have a, a difficult time gaining entry into that city. They'd put a high wall around it, and they would put guards upon it. Well, this particular city uh, has a great wall. We're going to look at that in just a minute. And the Bible says, and the wall of the city was built on 12 foundations. And then we see that the 12 foundations are built upon or are named for the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, how many of you would agree with me that Judas Iscariot is not one of those foundations whose name is there? Now, <clears throat> I believe, personally, that that 12th apostle was Paul. I don't believe the 12th apostle was Matthias. He was picked by man. That was not God's will. God did not tell them to go to that upper room and choose a replacement for Judas Iscariot. They did that on their own. I believe the 12th apostle is the apostle Paul. And then we see, beginning in verse number 15... We're going to see the blueprint of this city. Now this angel, who is one of those that was carrying one of those seven uh, vile judgments earlier, he says that he talked with him and he had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. So he had a measuring device. It was a measured city. And the Bible says that the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. Now, we need to understand a few things right here about the blueprint of this four square city. The first thing I do want you to know is that it is four square. That means that all four sides of it are equal. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us that when he measured the city, he says that it was 12,000 furlongs. Now, it doesn't matter whether he uh, measured it this way or he measured it that way. It was 12,000 furlongs. Now, according to uh, conversionmetric.com, a furlong is 660 feet long. So if you just simply multiply 660 feet divided by 12 or multiplied by 12,000, you'll find that this four-square city is 7,920,000 feet wide, 7,920,000 feet long, and 7,920,000 feet high. It's a perfect cube. Well, let's break it down a little bit. So if we take 7,920,000 feet and divide it by 5,280, what's that? That's a mile. 
Then you break it down a little bit more simplistically and you can find out how many miles this thing is. So from one side to the other, it's 1,500 miles wide and it's 1,500 miles long. You say, well now, that ain't big. That's not too big for heaven. I mean, that's not too big for where we're going to spend eternity. You think about all the people that's been saved down through the millennium. I, that, that's just not too big. And if you was to lay it down, set it down, uh, it would probably fit in the United States. It uh, would probably stretch from the Canadian border down to the Mexican border. And my goodness, it's 3,000 miles from coast to coast, to east to west. So it's only as half as wide as the United States. You say, that's not very big. But don't forget, it's 1,500 miles high. Did you know that before man went out to the moon, which is only a quarter million miles, that the highest man had ever got into outer space was 800 miles. That's as high as he got. He couldn't get any further without not being able to come back. This city is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, but it's 1,500 miles high. Well, let's put that in some perspective so that we can kind of get a handle on it. Let's, let's give it some scale so that we can understand exactly where we're going to be living and see if we're going to be elbow to elbow or if we're going to have plenty of room. In doing some study, I went out to a website, Britannica.com. You've heard of the Encyclopedia Britannica. According to their website, the Earth, planet Earth, in its entirety, its surface, its core, the whole thing, contains 336 million cubic miles. That's the size of planet Earth. 336 million cubic miles. That's a pretty big ball out there in space, isn't it? Yet we're one of the smaller planets that there is. Now then, when we're looking at this, we, we've, got to, we've got to figure out here what this four square city, uh, how many cubic miles uh, does it contain? Well, if we, we, we know, we know that it's 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles this way, and it's a perfect cube. So to find the cubic feet of a cube, you simply multiply the length by the depth or the width, the breadth and the length and the height. And when you do that, this four square city that we're going to be, that's going to be our forever home contains 3 billion, 375 million cubic miles. That means, simply put, that planet Earth would fit inside of our eternal home a little over 10 times. I believe we're going to have plenty of room. I did all that math to determine that I believe we're going to have plenty of room. 300, 3 billion, 375 million cubic miles. That's our forever home. Now what if, what if uh, Mike yonder, Mike Royal, lives down here in the lower eastern corner of, the, of that glorious city and let's say that... Uh, uh, let's say that I live up in the far northwestern corner and we're about as far away as we are, can get and we won't visit each other. How long would it take us to go see each other, you think? The speed of thought. Remember, the Bible says that it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And when he rose from the grave, he went wherever he wanted. 
He didn't have to walk down the road. He didn't have to go through a door or a window. He just thought it and there he was. He just showed up and it scared him every time. <laughs> Won't scare us up there. This is our forever home. Then the Bible tells us that there's the wall thereof around it, verse 17. The wall there is 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel, of the angel. Now that tells us, that's real simple there, a uh, cubit's 18 inches, it's about the distance from your elbow to your fingertip. It's about 18 inches times 144, it says 144 cubits. That comes out to 2,592 inches divided by 12. Tells you that that wall's 216 feet high. Then the Bible tells us what all is uh, going to be in this foundation of this wall. Remember the Bible says that back we read back earlier that the wall had 12 foundations and that they're named for the apostles of the Lamb. Well, the Bible tells us here that the building um, of the wall, excuse me, the foundation of the wall said it was, uh, it was garnished with all manner of precious stones. And uh, each foundation uh, is built of a particular stone. Jasper, sapphire, chalcedony, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, emerald, sardonyx, sardis, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprius, jacinth, and amethyst. And so these colors, uh, these beautiful colors of these stones, these reds and blues and purples and greens and oranges and all of these beautiful emeralds we will see in the foundation around that wall of that great city. And you've always heard about the pearly gates, haven't you? Everybody's heard of the pearly gates, but does the Bible talk about the pearly gates? Does the Bible tell that the gates are made of pearl? Well, look down in verse number 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. So this is our forever home. This is the new city, the new Jerusalem. Verse number 22 uh, deals with the new temple. Well, the fact is there'll be no temple. He said in verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. We see the new light. The Bible says that the city has no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So there won't be a need for the sun or the moon. The Lord Jesus Christ will light that city. The Shekinah glory of God will light that city. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And look at the security of this city. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Isn't that great? One eternal day. Won't be no darkness anymore. No need to shut the gates. It'll never be dark. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we see that uh, the, the, the re residents there in this glorious forever city are only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you remember Sunday morning when we were talking about the great white throne of judgment and how the, the people will argue with the Lord? And they'll say they did this, 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 and this, but their name's not in the book. And that's all that matters is that your name is in the book. The last new thing, uh, we'll just touch on this. The last new thing is in the first seven verses of uh, the 22nd chapter. There's going to be a new paradise. A new paradise. A new place where all is perfect, all is peace, all is well. The Bible says that he was shown in verse 1 of chapter 22, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, no pollution, no, nothing, nothing to, to, to uh, poison it or, or contaminate it. This water 
this river proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Jesus said in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the, save, the sayings of this prophecy of this book. So we see a new paradise given to us in this wonderful new land that God has prepared for you and for me. So, so hang in there. Better days are coming. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God tonight and we pray that Lord, that uh, we have had a little bit of hope build up in our heart, a little bit of excitement as we've looked at some blueprints of our home that's going to be forever. We thank you for it. We thank you for Calvary that made it all possible. And our Heavenly Father, help us to be uh, ready to meet you in that cloud and go to, go to our judgment and Lord, may we not just be looking forward to the goodies, but Lord, may we be ready for our judgment when we stand before you. And we pray now, Lord, you dismiss us with your grace and bless each one on their way home. Give them safe travel. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.